MTR trains will stop running in open air sections in future when the number nine tropical cyclone warning signal is in force. The Macau Jockey Club will terminate its operations on April 1st. And the Pacific Island nation of Nauru severs diplomatic ties with Taiwan. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The MTR decided to stop all services in its open air sections when the increasing gale or storm signal number nine is active in the future. It said the decision was made out of concerns for safety. A relevant report has been submitted to the government. Meanwhile, the public transport body said it has increased the number of designated train services near the mainland border. Timothy Lee has our top story. The MTR took a beating when it faced the force of Typhoon Koinu last October, during which the observatory issued the increasing gale of storm signal number nine. Train services and open air sections were stopped during the ordeal, affecting even the airport express. Many passengers were left stranded at MTR stations at the time. After conducting a review, the MTR has submitted a report to the government which included the decision to continue stopping all open air services when the increasing gale of storm signal number nine is active. The transport body stressed safety as its primary concern, adding that it is unsure about the available number of trained captains at times of tropical cyclones. The MTR said it will further promote the measure in order for passengers to familiarize themselves with the new arrangements. This says the total number of MTR passengers reached over 90 percent of the pre-pandemic figure, while the number of train rides increased to close to 90 percent of the pre-pandemic era. This man said he has to wait for around five minutes for each ride, but noted it was acceptable and that the situation is already better than during the pandemic. Starting next Monday, the MTR will increase train services on several lines during peak hours. They include the Chengkono, South Island, Tun Ma, Tongchong and Disneyland Resort lines. The MTR also plans to introduce new trains for its airport express in the next five to eight years. Meanwhile, around 40 percent of the one million or so people traveling across the border daily during the weekend are passengers of the East Rail Line. The MTR said it has increased train services traveling to Lok Chow Station in hopes of diverting some passengers heading to its more popular Lowell counterpart. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Macau authorities said today the operation of the Macau Jockey Club will end on April 1st. The termination came after the government and the club agreed to end the operations early. The operations of the Macau Jockey Club was supposed to last until 2042. However, the club submitted a request to authorities to terminate its horse racing franchise due to operation difficulties. The government plans to send 289 horses elsewhere by March next year. With an increasing number of mainland tourists taking photos in areas with potential safety hazards, some mountain climbing experts reminded visitors to take better precautions. The city's political parties also suggested increasing the amount of facilities and amenities in rural areas to improve the travel experience for tourists. This as two mainland tourists drowned in waters off Sheko yesterday. Mountain climbing expert Chung Kin Man reminded tourists to be careful of taking photos at natural sites such as Sheko, Lion Rock and Tung Lung Chow, adding rock formations in these areas are unstable. Meanwhile, lawmaker Lau Kwok Fan noted authorities can simplify the application process for outdoor activities for consumers to help develop the tourism industry. The Pacific Island nation of Nauru has severed diplomatic ties with Taiwan in favor of restoring relations with Beijing. The Taipei government said it regrets Nauru's decision. In Beijing, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs welcomed the recognition. 
Nauri's decision was made just two days after elections in Taiwan. Nauruan President David Andeyang noted on social media that Nauru acknowledges the One China principle, stressing diplomatic ties with Beijing will be beneficial to all his nation's interests. Nauru has a population of fewer than 20,000, with the nation's income coming primarily from phosphate exports to countries such as Australia and New Zealand. The island nation established diplomatic ties with Taiwan back in 1980. It switched recognition to Beijing in 2002 before breaking off ties in 2005. As of now, only 12 countries still retain full diplomatic relations with Taiwan. But said keeping Nauru strong means the government of Nauru has issued. China called for a peace conference on the war in Gaza as Foreign Minister Wang Yi visits nearby Egypt. Hamas aired video of three Israeli hostages, including one who is half Chinese, and said their fate would be disclosed today. The group that runs Gaza urged Israel to suspend its bombardment. David Garrett reports. Foreign Minister Wang Yi in the Middle East with a plan to try to bring about peace. Alongside Egypt's Foreign Minister Samar Shukri, Wang said there needs to be a large-scale, authoritative and effective international peace conference on the war in Gaza. He spoke of a concrete timetable to implement a two-state solution. He said there have been massive casualties among innocent civilians. China offered a third tranche of emergency humanitarian aid. Eight of the more than 130 in captivity are Thai nationals. The hostage crisis has affected those far from the Middle East. In Thailand, as the war marked its 100th day, 100 tuk-tuks carrying huge photographs of the hostages took to the major streets of Bangkok. The campaign called for an immediate freeing of hostages. Israel continues to try to dismantle Hamas. The military said it had shifted phases as it released these pictures from Khan Yunis on Sunday. They are now focused on the south of Gaza, Israel said, as they predicted again their war could take many months. David Garrett, TVB News. The US military says a fighter aircraft has shot down an anti-ship cruise missile fired from a Houthi-controlled area in Yemen towards an American warship in the Southern Red Sea. This comes as a spokesman for the Houthi rebels says, says U.S. aircraft have been flying close to Yemeni airspace and coastal areas. Tribes loyal to the militia group demonstrated support near the capital Sana'a over the weekend. The Houthis have threatened a strong and effective response after the U.S. and Britain carried out airstrikes last week. The strikes were in retaliation for the Houthis raiding commercial vessels in the Red Sea. Iran's President Ebrahim Raisi has condemned the U.S. airstrikes, saying the bombings reveal their true aggressive nature. Foreign Minister Wang Yi held talks with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri in Cairo on Sunday. Among the topics discussed were issues such as Taiwan's leadership election result, bilateral cooperation between China and Egypt, and the ongoing disruption to Red Sea shipping by Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen. David Rao tells us more. Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who is also a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee, met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi on Sunday. Wang conveyed the cordial greetings of President Xi Jinping to his Egyptian counterpart, saying the two leaders have established a solid mutual trust and deep friendship. He said the two nations have brought their bilateral relations to the best level in history under the guidance and care of their leaders. They discussed strengthening bilateral relations as well as the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict. Wang also held talks with Egyptian Foreign Minister Samer Shukri. He said they achieved a broad consensus on various issues. During a press conference following their meeting, Wang said the result of the leadership election in Taiwan cannot change the basic fact that there is only one China and Taiwan is part of China. He said the outcome of the recent election in Taiwan won't change the prevailing consensus of the international community on adhering to the One China principle. Wang noted that 80 years ago in Cairo, China, the United States and the UK issued the Cairo Declaration, which clearly stipulated that all the territories Japan had stolen from China, including Taiwan, should be restored to China. 
Wang said the documents formed an integral part of the post-war international order and laid the historical and legal foundation that Taiwan is an inalienable territory of China. He stressed Taiwan has never been a country in the past and certainly won't be a country in the future. Wang called for an end to the harassment of commercial ships in the Red Sea by Iran-backed Houthi rebels. He stressed the need to safeguard unimpeded global production and supply chains as well as the international trade order. Noting that the United Nations Security Council has never authorized any country to use force against Yemen, Wang called for refraining from taking any actions that will add fuel to the fire in the Red Sea and raise the overall security risks in the region. Dan Rahul, TV News. Still ahead. In Denmark, Frederick X is proclaimed the new king after his mother abdicates. Consumer Council tests find contaminants and some allergy-causing substances in some lipstick samples it tested. And volcanic eruption in Iceland for the second time in less than a month. Welcome back to TVB News. The Consumer Council found that 80% of 30 tested lipstick models on the market contained mineral oil, saturated hydrocarbons, and allergy-causing substances. Mimo Singai reports. The Consumer Council tested 30 lipstick models on the market, including 23 models of traditional lipsticks and 7 models of lip tints or liquid lipsticks. Among them, 24 models were detected with mineral oil saturated hydrocarbons, or MOSH, a substance that may accumulate in the human body. Moreover, five tested models were found to contain trace amounts of mineral oil aromatic hydrocarbons, ranging from 0.06% to 0.96%. Wire Cosmetics Europe advises that specific mineral oil ingredients in lip care products should not exceed more than 5% hydrocarbons. Five tested lipsticks went over the suggested limit. Gilly Wong, chief executive of the Consumer Watchdog, said those mineral oil hydrocarbons in lipsticks may affect one's health in the long term. If you are asking whether it can, it will bring immediate health risk, it will not, you know, because it accumulates in your body and in the long term, you know, it may have impact, you know, to your internal organs. As it is not bringing you immediate um, um, health impact, so what we believe is um, just to give you a peace of mind, you know, it may not be necessary for you to dispose the lipstick immediately. Meanwhile, the watchdog also said eight tested lipsticks were detected with two to three allergenic heavy metals, such as nickel and cobalt. The council has urged individuals to stop using those lipsticks if they experience allergic reactions, such as redness and swelling on lips. Nowadays, more people buy medical devices to monitor their health conditions at home. For instance, blood glucose meters for diabetic patients. The watchdog received 74 complaints last year regarding the poor quality of medical devices and selling strategies. One the complainant brought blood glucose test stripes from a pharmacy and found out that the stripes could only be used with an old model blood glucose meter, which he did not own. When he tried to exchange the stripes at the pharmacy, he was rejected by the staff there. He was then persuaded to buy the old model blood glucose meter. However, he realized from the packaging of the device that it had expired for over three years, while the accompanying Lancet had also expired for over 1.5 years. The customer returned to the pharmacy and talked to the staff. The customer received a refund after asking help from the council. The council said consumers should buy medical devices from credible traders with an office of physical stores. News 9, TVB News. Two people died after a taxi collided with a bus in Wan Chai. A 33-year-old female taxi driver was arrested on suspicion of dangerous driving causing death. Sources say the police's preliminary investigations indicate the taxi had run a red light. The incident occurred at around 9.30 p.m. last night at the junction of Fleming Road and Harbor Road when a city bus double-decker collided with a taxi. The taxi sustained serious damages after the crash. Bloodstains could be seen covering parts of the road. Two of the taxi passengers, a 47-year-old mainland woman and a 59-year-old man, sustained serious injuries. Both of them were later pronounced dead at hospital. Overseas, a volcano in southwestern Iceland erupted 
for the second time in less than a month on Sunday, sending lava snaking towards a nearby community and setting several homes on fire. More details from NBC News. Tonight, a tiny fishing village facing off against a wall of fire after a volcano in Iceland's southwest opened two cracks in the earth, sending rivers of lava creeping toward the town of Grindavik, just 30 miles from the capital. The town's nearly 4,000 residents were evacuated overnight, just in the nick of time. Already, homes in the town's outskirts are catching fire. Today's events will be remembered a long time, said this police official. We're probably just seeing the beginning of a chain of events that will continue and be difficult to deal with. No one has been hurt or injured so far, but workers are still struggling to divert these expanding rivers of flame. The government spent weeks building these protective ramparts, but this morning's eruption has already breached them. Workers racing toward the molten rock, reaching perilously close to the lava's edge to rescue heavy equipment that had been meant to build the barrier. It was awful to see the fissure open and the lava reaching the first houses, the town's mayor said. But Iceland is well prepared, sitting on a massive fault line. It's long dealt with volcanoes. Iceland's president said that while this slow motion crisis will damage property, it's unlikely to hurt any people. Though it has created another awe-inspiring spectacle in this land of ice and fire. Matt Bradley, NBC News. It was a momentous day for Denmark as Frederick X took the throne. Queen Margrethe II formally signed her abdication. The 83-year-old was the first monarch to relinquish the throne voluntarily for 900 years. The country enjoyed the occasion with thousands on the streets of Copenhagen to herald in a new era. David Garrett reports. The moment the Danish throne changed hands. In her New Year's speech, Queen Margaretha II shocked the country by telling Denmark she was abdicating and passing the baton to her son, Frederick. The Queen, who had reigned for more than 50 years, signed the papers. She vacated the chair, allowing Frederick to take the throne. The mother said, God save the king, as she left the room. Frederick, wearing a ceremonial uniform, then went out onto the balcony to meet the people. Hundreds of thousands braved freezing temperatures to be out on the streets of the capital and enjoy the pageantry. The new king, who had waited 55 years for this moment, looked emotional as he waved his hands in white gloves toward massive crowds waving red and white flags. The Prime Minister of Denmark, Meta Frederiksen, then proclaimed him as King Frederick the Tenth. The king's royal motto is united, committed for the kingdom of Denmark, another huge crowd as his wife was invited to join him. The queen wowed crowds in her white dress. The abdication leaves Denmark with two queens. Margaretha keeps her title, while Frederick's Australian-born wife becomes Queen Mary. The ceremony was watched in huge numbers by Australians on television. The couple met in 2000 at the Sydney Olympics and got married in 2004. They were joined by their four children. Frederick and Mary's eldest son, 18-year-old Christian, has become crown prince and heir to the throne. The king and queen then rounded off a historic moment after a moment moment of hesitation, sealing it with a kiss. He will be fantastic. And, and we are. loved his speech and, uh, and his, uh, everything he said. And, um, and we're looking so much forward to, uh, to him being our king yeah. for now. It was uh, good, a bit emotional also. Uh, it's new times because I, I love the, our, our queen as well. Copenhagen partied into the night, fireworks lit up the sky over Tivoli Gardens. The statue of Hans Christian Andersen looked on as Denmark starts a new chapter in its history. David Garrett, TVB News. Thanks for watching. Pearl Magazine is up next. Bye for now.